Lord Jesus, we just ask now. We know you're already in the room. But there are some changes that need to happen in each of our individual hearts. May the power of your spirit make those changes occur. Give the men and women in this room the courage, the vision to move forward in whatever those changes might need to be. But continue to move in this room. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's been a little bit since I've uh, preached at Warehouse. I've missed you guys. I've missed, sort of missed preaching. But uh, I, uh, I'm glad to be here. We had from February to March, um, Pastor Matt speaking at all the services. That was kind of crazy that he did that, but uh, it was awesome talking about our values. And, um, and we are now beginning to change our direction in what we've been talking about. We're pivoting a little bit. You'll hear a little bit about uh, where we're pivoting. We've been answering this question, what? What is church? Been answering the question, so we know a few things about church, right? Now we are pivoting to the church in action. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. So since I was 13 years old, I have been surfing. I love surfing. And I can talk a lot about surfing. Those of you who've had conversations with me, I am pretty skilled at not understanding what you're saying to me because there's a lot of smart people here. And I can pivot to something that I know what to talk about. And I can bring up an analogy about surfing. And everybody was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because I know a little bit about surfing. But I can talk to you a lot about surfing, but guess what it doesn't do? It doesn't make you a what? doesn't make you a surfer. But I can talk a lot about surfing. I can talk to you about history of surfing, the culture of surfing, individual surfers I like. I can talk to you about board design. I can talk to you about fin design. I can talk to you about hydrodynamics. What? I can even talk to you about board construction. I can talk to you about how they're using carbon fiber now. For the last 20 years, they're trying to refine that. Now they're starting to play around with Kevlar, building surfboards that are bulletproof with Kevlar. There's another thing that's sort of related to Kevlar called Enegra. I actually have a couple boards made of Enegra. I'll tell you how tough they are. They can be run over by a white GMC Yukon and then rolled back off of and only a little ding occurs. That actually happened in our house. Boards got run over and they were backed up and then only a small tiny little divot on the surfboard made out of a negra. So I can talk to you a lot about surfing, but it doesn't make you a surfer. But how many of you have never surfed on a surfboard before? Raise your hand. There's a lot of you. Come on now. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of you that actually have been on a surfboard. That's pretty amazing. So if I raise your hand. Do I know anybody back there? Raise your hand if you've never been on a surfboard before. So, okay, Isaiah. Isaiah. Okay, perfect. Isaiah. If I say, hey, Isaiah, listen. Never been on a surfboard. It's awesome. I want you to come with me. And I'm going to take you out on a surfboard. And I'm going to push you on a couple of waves so that you understand the timing of when to get up. And so I'm also going to teach you how to do a quick little burpee where you kind of do this burpee and then you jump sideways. And I'm going to show you exactly where to place the feet so you don't nosedive or you don't stall so you're there perfectly to glide down the wave. I'm going to teach you how to do that. We're going to spend a whole afternoon on pushing you on waves. And once I'm done pushing you, you're going to get the timing down, Isaiah. 
And then you're going to be able to paddle into your own wave and be able to surf. And if I take Isaiah on a journey with me, I'm not just talking about surfing, but I take him on a journey with me, show him how to surf, spend some time with him, he becomes a what? He becomes a surfer. But I can talk to you a lot about surfing. It doesn't make you a surfer. Let me ask you a couple questions. Who is the first person that you can remember to talk to you about Jesus? Think about that. Was it mom and dad? Teacher? Friend? Who was the first person to talk to you about Jesus? Here's a second question. Totally different, by the way. Who was the first person that taught you how to follow Jesus? Because I can talk to you a lot about Jesus. I can talk your ear off about Jesus. But it doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. It doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. So who was the person who taught you how to follow Jesus? How to become a disciple of Jesus? Not just talk to you about Jesus, but to show you, to take you on a journey of showing you how to follow Jesus. You have a name in your head? Because that process of hearing about Jesus and then it connecting to the heart and brain and somebody showing you how to experience Jesus is completely different than just hearing about him. So let's just be all on the same page of what disciple means. So here's a really rough definition of disciple. A disciple is somebody who makes disciples that makes disciples that makes disciples. It's an endless process. If you are journeying with somebody to make a disciple, they in turn at some point start making their own disciples that make disciples. Just so that we're on the same page. Again, I can talk to you a lot about Jesus. Doesn't make you a disciple. Who's teaching you how to follow Jesus? Who's teaching you how to grow in Jesus? So there's two questions that I want you to be able to answer these two questions by the end of the sermon. Something I want you to wrestle with. Something I want and praying that the spirit of God that is in this room will bring forth a name in your mind because I want everybody to have a name on these two questions. So here are the two questions and I'm going to bring these two questions up at the end of the sermon. So who is teaching you how to follow or grow in Jesus right now? Who is teaching you how to follow and grow in Jesus right now? Do you have a spiritual apprentice? Do you have a spiritual mentor? Do you have a spiritual parent who is teaching you to follow Jesus or grow in Jesus? I don't care at what age you are. You might be the oldest person in the room. If you stop growing, you become stagnant. So there's always room to grow. But who is teaching you to grow farther than where you're already at? Second question, person, that I want you to wrestle with of who this person is. So who are you teaching to follow Jesus? Are you someone's apprentice? Are you someone's spiritual mentor? Are you someone's spiritual parent? Paul is on his second missionary journey. He broke up with Barnabas. If you remember, they had a little scuffle. Broke up with Barnabas, took Silas, and then they took off to a town, and he's on his second missionary journey with Silas, and he meets a young disciple by the name of Timothy. And if you look in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, we're going to see this interaction of what happens here. First time he's ever met this young man named Timothy, that Paul ever met this young man named Timothy. Now, there's a lot of scholars who try to figure out how old was Timothy at the time of this interaction. And the only thing I can find is he was a young adult in his early 20s, 20, 21 years old, young guy. 
And so here's Paul, verse 1. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. Now it gives a little bit of his backstory here. Whose mother, talking about Timothy, Timothy's mother was Jewish and a believer. So she grew up Jewish, became a convert to Christianity is what this is saying. And whose father was a Greek. We don't know much else about his father. There's one other verse about it. But his father being a Greek, mother being a Jewish believer, they were on different pages. And we'll see why they were on different pages a little bit later. Now, in that day, if you were Greek, you may have been uh, under the belief of Gnosticism, which was a philosophy of the day influenced by Plato, and it was the greatest heresy of Christianity of the day. And it was prevalent about that. Actually, the book of John, the gospel of John, is all focused outwardly on talking against Gnosticism. There's all sorts of, of, of bits and pieces in there to prove that philosophy wrong. And so we don't know much about his father except that. He was Greek, could have been Gnostic, maybe not. We don't know. But Timothy was already a disciple, it says, where a disciple named Timothy. So before Paul met Timothy, he was already a disciple. The question is, is who showed Timothy how to become a disciple? Who showed Timothy how to be a follower in Jesus? This is the question. And so we actually have to leave the book of Acts temporarily, go to the letter that Paul wrote Timothy years later in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, answering the question, who showed Timothy how to follow Jesus in his early years? I am reminded, Paul says to Timothy, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois. And in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. Timothy's spiritual lineage came from family. Came from family. Now please don't misconstrue anything that I'm about to say here. But if you are a parent or a future parent, that's pretty much everyone here. Maybe. If you are a parent or a future parent, it is your responsibility to teach your kids how to follow Jesus. It's your responsibility. You cannot delegate that responsibility to the church, and you cannot delegate that responsibility to the school. It is your responsibility as mom and dad to be responsible to raise up your child to be a follower of Jesus. You, mom and dad, are the greatest spiritual influencer your child will ever have. It was designed that way. You can go all the way back to Deuteronomy 6, spend a whole lot of time in Deuteronomy 6, and it was the way that God designed it, was that mom and dad are to be the greatest spiritual influencer on their child. And we see that this worked for Timothy with only a grandmother and a mother because the father isn't mentioned in that equation in 2 Timothy. So it could be done if you are a single parent. You are still the greatest spiritual influencer on your child. What I love about the Adventist church, is there is this incredible spiritual ecosystem that if mom and dad take the role on seriously, the biblical role of raising up a disciple of Jesus in their child, and the church comes to build upon that foundation, and the school as they educate to send kids out they build upon that same foundation that it is a most unbelievable spiritual ecosystem for discipleship success if all institutions were working together for the purpose of building disciples. That's the church in action, by the way. 
but it starts with your children. Because Timothy had faith that was passed down from grandmother to mother and then to him, Paul took notice. And so did the town. Look at verse 2. It says, in Acts 16, verse 2, it says, The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. He was a man that lived the gospel in his work. We don't know what he did as, at work as a young adult, but at his work in town, he had the reputation of being a man of God that lived out the gospel. And Paul took notice to that. And then uh, first part of Acts chapter 16, verse 3, it says, Paul wanted to take him along the journey. Paul wanted to take Timothy along the journey. Isaiah, I'm going to take you one of these days along the journey to learn how to surf. I'm not going to talk to you about it anymore. I'm going to take you with me. We should have video for that, though, because it'd be great. And then, and then Paul looked at Tim and says, I want to take you along the journey and grow upon that foundation that your mom and grandmother built upon. That's what he's in, inviting Paul, uh, Timothy to do. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Is Timothy even interested was he even committed? Was he eager to continue to grow in Jesus? Did he even want a spiritual apprentice? Well, let's read the rest of verse 3 and see how committed he was. Paul wanted to take him along the journey. And so here's a plot twist. So he, Paul, circumcised Timothy. As a 20-year-old. Plot twist. You read Acts chapter 15, which if you remember, I preached in Acts chapter 15. And we know that circumcision had nothing to do with salvation or eternal life. Paul established that and fought for that. And, and Timothy was already a believer, so it was absolutely unnecessary, unless it was a cruel April Fool's joke, that it was unnecessary in our mind for eternal life. So then why did he do it? Well, read the rest here. It says, because of the Jews who lived in that area that he was living in, for they all knew, second and last reference of the father of Timothy, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Meaning this. The father opposed this Jewish tradition and practice, and he says, my son will not have that done to him. No way. But then why was it still done? It's bizarre. Not sure if it was because the father was Gnostic and they fought against that, but Jewish practice was within eight days of a Jewish baby being born, you should be circumcised. That was Jewish practice. But Timothy's commitment was beyond comprehension for him to say, yes, I'll have this done. That's how eager he was to learn because circumcision would eliminate any cultural barrier for him to be able to minister effectively in that town with the Jews present as he ministered to also the Greeks. That's crazy commitment because he didn't want it to be a cultural barrier. Crazy commitment, right? But he did it. And then verse 4 in chapter 16, this is when they began their journey. And along the journey, there were many lessons that Paul would be giving an incredible wisdom and insight as he poured into the life of this young adult. And it says, as they traveled from town to town, on ships, on horseback, on buggy, on the path, life was talked about. Lessons were learned. And then they went all the way to Jerusalem because as they reached Jerusalem, they uh, took these decisions for the people to obey to the people of Jerusalem. So they had a certain task 
to do. And here we see early evidence of Paul's commitment and method of discipling Timothy. Paul mentored Timothy by taking him along the journey. Paul spiritually nurtured Timothy, encouraged and supported Timothy along the way. A godly mother and grandmother raised Timothy, laid the foundation to his faith, and Paul helped build upon that foundation to continue the growth trajectory of his spiritual life. See, even as Timothy started making his own disciples, because disciples make disciples that make disciples, and he wasn't traveling with Paul anymore, Paul's in prison, Timothy gets a letter of encouragement in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy from Paul. A letter that had wisdom, a letter that had guidance, a letter of encouragement. And he gave that, that letter to Timothy, Paul gave that letter to Timothy, even as he was making disciples years later. So does the process of making disciples that make disciples work? See what the Bible has to say. Verse 5, chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew daily in numbers. Does the discipleship method of making disciples work? That's how they grew the church. When the church stops making disciples, when you stop being a spiritual apprentice, when you stop seeking to have a spiritual parent, the church does not grow. And let me just tell you, the discipleship work is the dirtiest work in the church because you've got to get into people's yucky life. And that's part of the journey. All Christians need believers who are further along on their spiritual journey to be a spiritual apprentice, to be a mentor, an encourager, a discipler. Every one of us needs somebody that's older than us, that's been, may not even be older, could be younger but more advanced and farther along in their spiritual journey. And all Christians who are farther along on their journey should be teaching believers how to experience Jesus. Support them when they fall, not beat them up and kick them when they're down. And help them back up to continue to be on track. So Paul paints this visual of how are we to treat um, younger believers. So I have a little helper here. That little helper's name is Maven. And Maven's going to come up and help me. She sounds like she's a little hungry, which is perfect timing, Maven. This is Maven. Hi. Oh, yeah. So let me ask you guys, if Maven's hungry, because she sounds nice, nice, like a little hungry, okay, would it be appropriate for me to feed her some pretzels? What, mothers? No, that was angry, no. Well, she has one tooth. She can just suck on, on the salt and then get it soggy and be able to swallow it, right? Okay, something a little less jagged. Hmm. Would it be appropriate for me to give her a peanut M&M? Oh, of course. Whoever said yes would like to have these after church. They're yours. But, hey, would it be? No, absolutely not. Um... This is a little softer. Uh, we can pretend this is a steak because it's full of protein. Would it be appropriate for her to have a protein bar? It's got cashews in it. Ooh, yes it does. Okay, here's something soft. How about this? It's gummy bears. Someone gave it to somebody in our house. Valentine's, I guess. But uh, gummy bears. It's soft. It's chewy. Would that be appropriate? Why? Because why? What would happen to her? She would choke. You can't give Maven solid food yet. She's only one, right? You can't. Because what? She will choke. She can only handle so much. So I have another helper. And um, that helper's name is Noah. So Noah, I don't know where you're at, but I need you to come up here. Thank you, Maven. So Maven, um, obviously, she is not capable of eating solid foods. But hey, 
Noah, Noah turned 17 on Wednesday, right? No, hey, boy, you're not sitting down. Get down. So, so come on, sit on your daddy's lap. Come on, buddy. So sideways like this. Okay, so would it be weird? I got some formula. Okay, Noah, come on. Here. All right. Would this be weird if you saw Noah and I out on a park and you just walked by in a park and you said, what is going on here? Would this look, does this look weird? But it's milk. It's okay. He was hungry. Is that okay? Huh? He said, it's okay, buddy. It's okay. Happy birthday. I love you. Thank you. So, so here's the crazy thing. Paul talks about this for young believers. Okay? He talks about how to handle. There's three different people, three different categories of people here he's talking about. Of how we are to, to be patient as somebody who's a spiritual apprentice to newer believers. And he says this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. He says, I gave you milk. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Maven wasn't ready for solid food. She wasn't ready to eat a steak. She would choke on it. And Paul is saying, careful with the new vulnerable believers. They're not ready for this. They can only handle this for now. And then in Hebrews 5 verse 12, he says this. Again, Hebrews, Paul writing to people who've known about God forever. Hebrews, he says this. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers. You should know better. You ought to be at that level of teaching others how to follow Jesus. He says, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. So that's the other category. Ones that can't handle solid food yet. Ones that should be able to handle solid food but still need a little bit of milk. And you need milk, not solid food. And then there's the category of those who are eating solid food, who are eating steak. So we've got three categories of people here. Those that should be eating steak, those that are eating steak, steaklets, don't get offended, and those who just need milk. And here are the questions that I have asked you to wrestle with. So pull out, I don't know where my phone is, but pull out your phone, put into notes the two names for these questions. Who is teaching you how to follow and grow in Jesus? Who is teaching you how to follow and grow in Jesus? You know, this would be a nice thing. Think of your past history. Some of you older folks. Who has taught you in your past how to grow and follow Jesus. I've never shared this before, but I I had a principal. Um, His name was Bill Farmer. Loved the guy. He taught us how to grow in Jesus. Um, A lot how to grow in Jesus through punishment. (laughs) Because I got in trouble a lot. And um, I had the honor of speaking at his funeral. And I remember the power of his life, what it meant to me. And, and I remember I made a commitment 
the next month after his funeral, I made a commitment to write a handwritten letter to 31 people that have taught me how to follow Jesus. And there were 31 people all over the United States that I sent letters to. It took a while to find one. One of them, one of them just turned 104 years old uh, just recently. She, she was my youth leader, by the way. Her name's Irene. And, and so go back and think about all the people who taught you how to follow Jesus in your history. Thank them. Tell them how they taught you as well. But who has taught you, who is teaching you right now how to grow and follow Jesus? Write that name down. And then who are you teaching to follow Jesus? Now know that the lie from Satan is this. I'm not qualified to do that. That's absolute direct lie of the devil. If you love God, if you are saved by grace, if you confess your sins to Jesus, you are cleansed in his eyes. Maybe not, you know, other people's eyes, but they don't matter. You are cleansed in the eyes of God. Who are you teaching how to follow Jesus? If your life is an absolute wreck last week, yesterday, you can take somebody through a journey of your bad decisions in your life just a week ago and saying, here is what God is teaching me through that. And there's incredible pain involved. But come along this journey with me because here's the lessons I'm learning. Who are you teaching to follow Jesus? And who is teaching you to follow Jesus? Father God, I pray that you will not let this room um, rest, stir their heart, stir their soul, for them to reach out to the individuals that they wrote down whether it is to thank them, whether it is to say, hey, can we go out for breakfast or a cup of coffee? And Lord, help this community become a community where we are journeying together in transparency to teach each other how to follow Jesus in a greater way. As Proverbs calls it, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man to another. And we need to have some iron relationships in this room. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.